Hey, what up? What's good, everybody? It's your boy BQ with the Impact Lounge, number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. And this is another solo edition of the Cool Factor podcast. And I'm going to be giving you some thoughts and preview on Slammiversary, which is happening tomorrow night. So I'm going to break that down a little bit, what I'm thinking about the card, what I'm thinking is going to happen. I'm expecting a good show because Slammiversary never fails. I'm going to run down this episode of Impact super, super quick, though. I feel like I kind of owe it to you guys because last week we didn't review the episode at all. I know that many of you did like the episode. Me and TW disliked it so much that we didn't want to talk about it. And, you know, we've never done that before, but we didn't want to get on and just do a 100% negative show. I shouldn't say 100% because they had a great main event last week, but uh, we just didn't want to review the show. So we did something completely different. Uh, so I feel like I'll with you guys to kind of run down this show real quick. And I know I've said quick before, but this is going to be quick, quick. I'm just going to run down the meat and potatoes and how it ties into Slammiversary, which is happening tomorrow night. Again, this is the Impact Lounge. If it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button because it's the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. Okay, so let's get into this episode super, super quick. Um, I'm just going to kind of run down the results, but you know, give my general thoughts, because again, I didn't talk about anything last week. So you got to you got to know where my head's at going into Slammiversary. So and okay, let me throw this out there first. Good episode. Uh, last week, again, didn't like it. This one I thought was much, much better. And um, usually go home shows I don't enjoy. There's just something about that every year where I always feel like they put like a really weird episode together that doesn't tie well into the pay-per-view. I thought they did a much better job this time around, and I'm pretty excited for it. I'm really excited for tomorrow night. I wasn't initially because some of the, you know, marketing promotion things. Uh, the build has been the build has been okay for the most part. Uh, it's not they haven't knocked it out of the park, you know. But someone had asked me about a week and a half ago. Are you excited for Slammiversary? I'm like, I'm not really, just because I, I just wasn't. I, I didn't. There was no buzz around the show, and there still is very little buzz, but. I'm getting more excited as the time is coming because I know Slammiversary is the pay-per-view every year that they don't slack. Everyone just seems to bring it. And it's, I, I can't remember the last time I was like, this wasn't a good show. So um, we're going to go down this real quick. The, 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 it kicked off with Tasha Steeles and Savannah Evans against Mia. I mean, uh, yeah, Tasha Steeles and Savannah Evans against Mia Yim and Jordan Grace. I say this every so often, Jordan Grace looks like an effing star. She posted the other day on social media one of her very first pictures in Impact and the current one, and wow, what a transformation. Mia Yim's another one that also really looks like a star now. What I liked about this episode of Impact is that the people who needed to get momentum got some momentum. I talked about this on an upload that I did the other day. I don't remember exactly what I was talking about. Um, oh, it was it was my new uh, Moving the Needle podcast. I was talking about this, and I was saying no one has momentum right now. Who's like going into the pay per view with some kind of degree of momentum? I didn't feel like anybody was. This episode, I thought, did a better job of doing that, of creating that, of giving a few wrestlers some kind of, I keep saying the word, but some kind of momentum hanging. Uh, excuse me, heading into the pay per view. On cue, my cat who just lays here when I'm in my office, makes no noise, and then the minute I start recording, just decides he's going to mess with absolutely everything and piss me off. Anyway, I enjoyed this tag team match quite a bit. The, t the team who needed to win won the match. Tasha Steeles needed to win this match. He's done a decent job as a knockouts champion, but I don't think they've done a, a great job presenting her as the knockouts champion. You know what I mean? Like she's She's running with it, but I don't think they've done her a whole lot of favors. What I predicted for this match a long time ago, and I'll get into this again when I uh, preview Slammiversary, was that Deanna Peraza was going to win and was going to have some kind of mix in with Mia Yim at the end and set up Deanna versus Mia Yim at Bound for Glory. Mia Yim's going to be in the match in the main event at Bound for Glory. I should I say main event, but I mean the Knockouts Championship match. She's going to be in that match. You know how Impact rolls. But now I'm thinking with what happened. They might be setting up her versus Jordan Grace because of the little miscue they had here. 
as I said at the top, uh, the, at the top, Jordan Grace really looks like a star right now. And I think it's that time that she wins the title again. You know, I talked about this on the podcast with TW, the last one we did, where I was saying where they really dropped the ball with EC3s, they didn't recognize when he needed the world title back. You know, there's, there's, um, I think they do it with Deanna Perrazzo very well. They've done it with some wrestlers very well. There's some guys and girls who they're good without the title. And then there's just the period of time. It, it just feels right for them to win again. So I think for Jordan Grace, it, it, it's time. So I know I just kind of previewed the match there a little bit, and I'm probably going to repeat all that here again in a bit, but really good knockouts match to open up. My only real complaint about this episode, and I've noticed, I've noticed this over the past several, and I say past several, it had been doing this forever, but it's really standing out over the last several episodes, all these roll-up wins. Everybody is rolling people up. Everyone is winning by rolling someone up from behind or, or reversing a move with a roll-up. It's like they don't want to give anyone a clean win because a clean win is really what's going to give you some momentum. You know, a win is a win, but, you know, every time you do that roll-up stuff, it, it just cheapens it just a little bit. It lessens it just a little bit. And that's what I think. I don't think it happens so much here because there was kind of a different story in the match. At least Tasha Steele's got the win, but she rolled up Jordan Grace. Um, and then after that, the next match that we had was... Mike Bailey versus Trey Miguel. Really, really good X Division match. And I was thinking during this match, I remember when I first started reviewing Impact. I mean, there was, uh, you know, a movement going around, like bring back the X Division. Because they got they completely got away from the X Division. And they had a couple dudes, Mandrews, and um, man, who else did they have? Uh, Tigre Uno just left when I started uh, reviewing. They had a few dudes. Uh, and it's hard for me to even remember everybody at the time. Obviously, DJ Z, uh, Trevor Lee. So they, they had some dudes who could go, but they just abandoned the X Division style of wrestling for the longest time. It was really weird. And now you look at it, we're really getting that back. They're really doing a great job. I'm not a huge fan of, in a build, wrestlers who are involved in a multi-person match having matches against each other. Like, I just... I just, you know, I, I'm bringing the word momentum up again. There's people who are not involved in the pay-per-view. And I feel like a majority of the build, they should be getting, competitors should be getting wins against those guys. I don't think people should go into a pay-per-view where we've seen their, their shoulders pinned on the mat. And that's why they keep doing these roll-ups, because they don't want someone to get a clean win over someone who's in a pay-per-view match. That's, that's really all this is. Obviously, I don't work for the company, but it's clear... That's what they're doing. They're, they're afraid to do that. They feel it's going to lessen someone. They felt Mike Bailey, in this case, was going to be lessened if he had his shoulders pinned to the mat clean. Now, it, it was clean, but, I mean, it was a you know reversal of a roll-up. There was an X Division match two weeks ago. I want to say it was with Mike Bailey and someone else, or Trey and someone else, or one of the machine guns. But it was the same thing. That finish was almost identical to what happened a couple weeks ago. So the whole, you know, roll up, I'm shocked, whatever. But Trey was the one who needed some momentum going into this match because he's the former X Division champion. Last time he had an X Division title match with Mike Bailey and um, uh, Ace Austin at the pay-per-view, he was like a, a complete afterthought. Now we know that, you know, some information has come out when he was doing his interview with Tom Hannafin. I'm going to be reviewing that tomorrow morning that he was – I believe injured. I think, I think that's what he was talking about. I got to go back, listen to the interview before I uh, review it, but I think he was saying he was injured. So there was a reason he was off TV for a while, but he really came off like an afterthought. He needed to get this win right now to have a little steam going into the pay-per-view. So really, really excellent match. Then we had um, Masha Slamovich versus uh, Alicia Edwards, which is Giselle Shaw on her corner. That's my team right there. You guys know that. It was a squash match that made sense because Alicia did get some offense in. Did the offense win? No. I mean, work? No. You know, uh, she didn't feel it, but it wasn't a, just a, you know, 20 second squash match. Like there was enough to establish um, Alicia is not one of those other girls where she got a few forearms in. And then the way that Masha turned around and hitting her with the sp hit her with the spinning back fist was really well done. That was really crisp, very impactful. And then she got the win. I thought they were trying to set up Masha versus 
uh, Giselle Shaw after. Well, I'm pretty sure that's what they're going to do, but it, they, I, I didn't like the way they did it. Alicia got a job or entrance, which was, I mean, come on, come on, Impact. And it came off so cheap because you just hear Penzer with, and her opponent. They just come in from a commercial, whatever, and her opponent. Usually when you do the job or entrance, you know, you at least say so-and-so's in the ring already. I mean, something. So that, that, that was pretty bad. So anyway, first two matches of the show end with a roll-up. Third match, no squash match. Fourth match was, I'm sorry, I'm uh, scrolling here, looking at the results. I'm going to hit pause for a second because I just messed up my computer. I didn't mean to say I messed up my computer. I messed up my phone. So uh, that's what I'm reading the results on. So uh, we had the uh, the Briscoes. We're doing excellent work with Impact right now. My God, every time they're out there, they really, really stand out. And they took on the Bullet Club duo of Jay White and Chris Bay. We knew that the Briscoes were going to win this match. This was one of those things where it's just like, this is just a cool match. We're just going to enjoy it for what it is. We know Chris Bay is going to take the pin. Like, you know all these things just looking at the match graphic, what's going to happen. We know already that Jay White's not going to stick around. I mean, uh, well, his time with Impact is done for now. Maybe he, you know, returns back a little bit later. We don't know what the Bullet Club's going to look like after Slammiversary with the pending free agency of the Good Brothers. And then Ace Austin is coming in. They have a couple guys who go in and out, Hikaleo and um, Phantasma, El Phantasma, whatever his name is. I'm always messing that up. And then obviously Chris Bay. So we don't know what the, the version of it is going to look like in Impact. You know, but no one expected the Bullet Club to win this match. Really excellent tag match. Really, really good. The Good Brothers weren't even that annoying on commentary. They win with a roll-up. There is, I mean, I know we see Chris Bay take a lot of L's, but the tag team champions win with a roll-up. So we had the tag team champions and the knockouts champion both win with roll-ups. We got roll-ups for three out of the first four matches. So that's something to me, you know, when you're putting a show together, that goes towards what I've said in the past about the multiple DDTs and the multiple spear finishes and the multiple pile driver finishes when they do, when they have episodes like that, this, this is the same thing. Like everyone can't just win with a freaking roll up, but a really, really enjoyable match. I'm not talking about anything backstage at all. Um, Honor No More took on uh, Aces and Eights. So I wanted to hate this at first, or I, I guess I should say I expected it to, because a lot of people on social media were saying, oh, this is the you know, watered down ver version of aces and eights and da 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 da. Um, I thought that w when they had the interview segment, I thought they sounded okay. And, you know, it made sense storyline wise. You know, part of Impact's past, they obviously kept PCO out of this because they don't know what they're doing with him. I'm sure they think they know what they're doing with him. I, I just don't know. But you can't have you know, one week he's he's trying to take out the, the past of TNA, and then the next week he's looking for baby face pops and the crowd is cheering for him, and you're telling the crowd to cheer for a guy who's also trying to take out the members of TNA's past, present, future. You know what I mean? It just makes no sense whatsoever. So they did a good job keeping him out of this, as they should have. But the I thought just the match made sense as kind of like a little little warm-up, you know? They're already going to go against some people from the past, so why not give them a match like this? I thought I thought it worked. I thought it was cool. Last week, even as good as that main event was, my biggest issue with it is that they gave us the best part of they gave away for free the best part of the match when it was Kazarian and a Motor City Machine Guns against Eddie and um, OGK. Like you gave us the best part of the match, so that was that was kind of the issue I had with it because whoever they bring in for these other Impact guys, they're not going to hold a candle to that. Well, we already we already know that one is Nick Aldis. And I think they took a complete dump with that one. The way they announced it was just, oh, yeah, by the way, Nick Aldis um, over We Own the Night is, is going to um, join this team. They actually had a storyline going like, okay, you guys pick someone. And, okay, I got some ideas. You, you can't be like, I got some ideas and not have, you know, Christopher Daniels or someone like show up, have, have Nick Aldis show up, random as shit, you know, never hasn't had anything good to say about the company in a while. And I thought he was a good NWA champion initially before the pandemic, but then they started like really tw towards the end before the pandemic pandemic, they started really, really overexposing him. 
where he just had to talk for half an hour every episode of NWA, and he still continues to talk. And, and um, I thought he lost a lot of steam doing that over the years, but, it, but initially he was a good NWA champion. I'm just not excited about him in this particular match. You know, they brought him back for a little bit with the Global Force wrestling era, and that didn't go very well. So I, I don't know. Um, it's it's disappointing for me. I think I think they took a, a huge dump with that. But um, but this match made sense to just say hey, some aces and eights guys. It's a little bit of long term storytelling because they tried to take out D'Lo before. Well, they did take him out. They took him off commentary. Thank you. And now he's you know doing his backstage role. They tied it into the episode, so it worked. It it really really worked. I like D'Lo putting the cut on. I probably like this match more than most people. I said I wanted to hate it just because people had me con- preconditioned to think I was going to. I didn't mind it. You know, I, I know that these are, uh, you know, not the standout guys of from Aces and Eights by any means. I wouldn't even mind if they stuck around for a little bit. But Tom did say at the end of the match, oh, they got rid of Aces and Eights forever. But I thought it was a cool little match for what it was. It fit everything going on. It wasn't like randomly bringing Charlie Haas out, who's 55 years old and, you know, gets injured for the match and is out for the rest of the year. You know, they, it wasn't something like that. It wasn't like bringing Ken Shamrock in, who's old as balls. Someone said they hope Ken Shamrock is the one that they put in this match. I really effing hope it's not. I, I really, this, they, they, they dropped the ball. I really think they dropped the ball. But they, they, they took a shit with adding Nick Aldis to the match. People are expecting James Storm or Christopher Daniels. I think with James Storm, it's been, who, you know, we've been there, done that with him. But it could work. But if they were to come with like Ken Shamrock because he was like the first NWA champion that they had, oh no, no, girl, no, boy, no. So I enjoyed this match for what it was. I enjoyed the beatdown afterwards, or I shouldn't say the beatdown, but this the post match angle. I liked seeing D'Lo getting a little come up in there and hitting the sky high. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you know, just the whole little post match angle angle was cool. And then uh, I'm not going to talk about the the contract signing. I hate contract signings. I mean, the pay-per-view was a, tomorrow. It was three days away as of the episode. Why are they just signing a contract? I, I haven't really enjoyed the majority of the build on TV for that match. Uh, Eric Young's been, we're going to get into that in, in the slam reverse preview. So let me not get too much into it, but that is your very, very quick impact wrestling review. I hope you guys dug it. But uh, as I said, I, I thought the episode was cool much better than last week's like last week's i i've i can't even i uh let me just take a deep breath and let's get into slam anniversary i'm gonna preview this show give you some of the thoughts that i have digital media championship match rich swan versus brian myers when they announced this i knew it was going to be on the pre-show because there's no graphic the title means nothing um you know i think it's a fall from grace for rich swan personally but i love rich swan I like Brian Myers a lot. I know his contract has run out with impact, so I don't expect him to win this match. Rich Swan's going to win. Brian Myers is going to wear the ring, the championship to the ring, obviously, because that's a, because uh, what's his hell? What's his name? Matt Cardona stole the belt, but he's injured. So, you know, obviously he's going to hand it off and uh, he's going to wear it to the ring. Then Rich Swan's going to win it. He's going to get the title back. And then, does well with it i have no idea cardona as a digital media champion really worked and it's not just because he's injured now i'm just talking about when he did have the belt and they had him healthy i thought he was going to be the best part of the show i really did i really thought the major players in general was going to be like the best part of the show and it, they were bullshit what they did with them was nothing and major missed opportunity no pun intended reverse battle royal I've said too, it's going to be a bit of a comedy match. We already know that a, a bit, you know, obviously they're going to get to the final eight or whatever it is. And it's, it's going to be a little more serious, but you know, you already know we got swinger and Zicky dice and all that. I wish we could know a lot of the participants that goes back to social media marketing, you know, just, you don't have to give us the whole field, but you know, on Twitter announce, announce half the field, give us something, you know what I mean? But at least this episode touched on it a little bit touched on the rules but i really think they could benefit from the rules and and certain video packages circulating social media and circulating youtube because their smallest audience is the tv show you know when you're talking from a social you know, let me not say that i said that completely wrong their biggest audience is the tv show but there's 
you can only do that. I guess what I was getting at, you can only do that once a week. You only have a TV show once a week so that you it's up to social media the rest of the week to really, really promote this show. So, you know, there's got there's got to be more of a balance between the two. I don't know who's going to win this thing. I'm not I'm not mad about them doing it. First of all, they're playing into that. It was a, a bad concept. And maybe they just want to have a good match and make people forget about, you know, what, what Russo did before. We'll see. I have no idea who's going to win the match. But if I had to go with my gut, because there's no stakes, there's nothing on the line here, it's going to be someone from TNA's past. Probably someone who's not in the best shape in the world. Like, like, uh, like what's his hell? Um, America, America's Most Wanted, dude. Why is his name escaping me at the moment? Uh, Chris Harris, like he'll probably win something like that. I don't think it's going to be anyone from the current roster though, but I'm curious to see what they do. They're leaning into it. as it being just, they're just going to have fun with it rather than take it too serious. So we'll see. It'll be interesting to see, see if interesting to see if some of the knockouts are involved in that as well. Kind of like they do with the call your shot gauntlet. All right. Uh, Monsters ball match, Sammy Callahan versus Moose. Will the match be good? Yes. Slammiversary is going to be good, folks. I know we're, we're freaking out about the ticket sales. And then obviously the promotion of the show has been weak, but they're going to be okay. They always find a way to get the people in the stands for the pay-per-views, you know, by hook or by crook. But the pay-per-view itself is going to be good. I wasn't a huge fan of some of the builds. You know, it was, it was okay. They've done worse. But this particular one, Sammy Callahan and Moose, kind of gone on records here and saying that they dropped the ball when they had Sammy Callahan return to return and attack him because they kept teasing Sammy Callahan was coming. He had been injured for so long and impact doesn't get the coverage that AEW and WWE get where you like, you have an idea when someone's coming back. We really had no idea when Sammy was coming back. So there was no need to tease him because he's not even wrestling. He's not doing anything. You know, he's just, he's just doing this backstage stuff. So it would have just been better. You know, they didn't need it. Like, you tease someone if you need to promote an episode with them coming on and they're having a match. You know what I mean? But I thought uh, if he just would have showed up out of, out of nowhere, then it would have been so much more impactful. And I think we could, it would have got the ball rolling a little quicker with this feud. This is the first time though with Moose that I'm just like, usually Moose is just gold in every, every feud with what he does backstage. And I'm just not feeling it right now. Moose is not, the champion anymore so he doesn't have to wrestle as much but he hasn't he hasn't wrestling at all i think they mentioned he might have been hurt also he might have had surgery so they had to keep him off tv but you've got a match here first of all the hardcore stuff and all that you guys know my opinion on that but you got a match here with two guys who have not been in the ring in a while so i think the hardcore stipulation is going to help it and Ultimately, I think when the match is over, I'm going to be like, yo, this was pretty good. These guys delivered because these, those two always do. But just the, just the backstage foolishness with the lights flickering, like what Moose is scared of the dark now, you know, the lights, the lights go out and I, what, what the, you, you know, he turned the lights back on so you can see now. So if he's coming, you can see him coming. Like if he shut out the lights completely and you couldn't see a damn thing, then, then get scared, you know, but I just thought it was all a little corny for, for two guys who can do so much more and do so much better. But maybe their hands were tied behind their back a little bit. Um, if I had to pick a winner, uh, man, I think Moose is going to win. I know, I know the easy option is Sammy Callahan because he, he's returning. But Sammy, I mean, Sammy never gets pay-per-view wins. And he's been fine. I mean, he, he, he loses a lot. I mean... God, over the years, he's, he's taken a lot of pins, a lot of losses, but he's fine. Like his, his position remains good. Moose has a couple. He's com coming off a couple of losses to Josh Alexander. I think he needs to win this match. I think he's going to win it. And then I think the, the feud is going to continue, even though it's a Monsters Ball match. I think the feud is going to continue. I'm also interested, <coughs> excuse me, if this is going to be some kind of cinematic match, if they're going to do backstage stuff with this. Because, again, we're talking about two guys haven't been in the ring. One was hurt. I believe the other, I think Moose said he had an injured shoulder or something. He had surgery, something along those lines. So you have a couple guys that if you've got something like that going on with them and they're not 100%, maybe there's some backstage stuff. Maybe they've done half of this already. 
you know so it wouldn't be it wouldn't surprise me if we didn't get some kind of backstage cinematic over some shit ass music match but i'm gonna go with moose on that one impact originals they're saying it could be anyone past or current i don't think there's an impact original on the roster you know they always whip out suicide if they need to but we know that it's the motor city machine guns frankie kazarian and nick aldis uh not that nick aldis is an original I guess you depends on what you call an original, but they're taken um, on Honor No More. And, you know, Honor No More got a little momentum because they got a win, especially Kenny King and uh, and Vincent getting that win. They didn't they didn't have a PCO wrestle in that match. You know, it made sense to have uh, Kenny King win. I mean, in there um, and be on the winning side, which was good for him, especially since he won a match last week, too. Honor No More is another thing that had the potential to really be the best, the potential to really be the best part of the show. And what have I said in the past? Like with Eddie Edwards as the heel, we should have been tuning Eddie every tuning in every week for what's Eddie Edwards going to do this week? What's he, you know, how is his character going to change and progress? And how is Honor No More just going to continue to take over? Like we just didn't get that. And one of the reasons I pointed out is because the the roster lacks pinnable baby faces. Aside from like Laredo Kid. There's not baby faces that can just take losses on the roster, and when you when you ha- when you in a position like that, like you got a couple heels, you can do it with, you know, Zicky Dice. Uh, well, I mean, they kind of act like tweeners, him and Swinger, but I think they're technically he- heels. Um, you know, John Schuyler. There, there's um there's a handful of dudes that the baby faces can get wins over if they need them. We just don't have that on the other side. And when you have that, how is Honor No More supposed to, you know, keep it up, keep it going? So, you know, that's a bit of a problem. Willie Mack was someone that was fairly pinnable if needed, but he's he's not around now. So, um, you know, that's a problem. Honor No More should be going into this a lot hotter than they are. But unfortunately, they're not. The PCO stuff, again, really, really freaking weird. Uh, that was part of the reason I hated the episode last last week so much, the, you know, I mean, the week before, just the babyface stuff with Morrissey and and all that stuff. Like, I just don't get it. I don't know what they're trying to do. You just can't have an angle where he's trying to injure people on your roster and people from your past, your glory years, and then have a match where he's looking for babyface pops and getting the crowd. Because then the crowd looks foolish because they're cheering for this guy that wants to take down the company. I don't get it. I don't understand it at all. (sighs) Ugh. So hopefully he's just like full fledged heel in this match. Hopefully he doesn't like turn on honor no more or something something ridiculous. But they did a good job, you know, keeping him out of the out of the episode. As far as the fifth person though for this match, you you got to go. It's got to be Christopher Daniels, man. Um, that's what I want to see because with James Storm, we've seen James Storm return and leave and return and leave. It's I know he lives in the area. It's just not as special anymore in my opinion. But it can work. It's better than, you know, God, I, I'm so worried they're going to do something like, uh, I'm trying to think of a name. I, I mean, something like suicide or something like, but they can't. It has to be some kind of surprise. It's a fifth member. It has to be, you know, hopefully it's just, I just hope they don't do something stupid. I hope it's something, you know, there's options. There's people who, who the fans want. So I just hope that's where they go with it. I don't know what curveball they can really come up with. I don't know how much it can really surprise us because there's not that many options, in my opinion, that you could use. You, there was more options in that Nick Aldis spot you could have used because that wasn't the, the final person you're announcing. You could have, you know, obviously they went Nick Aldis. So, you know, um, as I said earlier, I wasn't a fan of how they announced that. It was just very like, oh, by the way, this dude is going to be in the match. We own the night, you know, it it just seemed like with the storyline, these guys were going to go out and be recruiting, you know, like they could have done something interesting with that. Have some fake phone calls, something. Don't just Nick Aldis show up. Like what the hell is his connection to those guys? You you know what I'm saying? So I'm worried about this match because honor no more. If they lose, they're done. There's no rehabbing them at this point. They're done. Maybe their contracts are done. After Slammiversary. We know Murray Kanellis is done. Maybe these guys are done too. 
the the Ring of Honor stuff hasn't kicked off yet, not even close. So maybe they're waiting that out. But it just doesn't seem like they're going to win. And if they don't win, they, you can't do anything with them. Nothing. And it doesn't make sense for Slammiversary for these Impact Originals to lose. So they're going to win. You know, I can see the five of them holding each other's arms up after the match. And like, we did it. You know, we rid the company of honor no more. I mean, that might be where they're going with the story, like that the Impact Originals get rid of them forever. You know, so maybe it's something like that. Maybe they know, because I think PCO is here to bound for glory. So maybe these guys are gone. They know PCI's, PCO excuse me, is going to stick around. So they're just like, oh, we're just going to transition into a baby face up to the pay-per-view. And I, I don't really know. I, ho- I would like to see Kenny King stick around personally, but I don't know. So I, I think the Impact Originals are going to win that one. I, I think there's no question about it. Knockouts Tag Team Championship match. You know, usually this is a match on the pre-show, but it influenced defending against Rose, Mary, and Taya. This is another build that they, you know, they use a little long-term storytelling, but, you know, some of the backstage stuff is is corny. The dynamic between Rosemary and Taya is good. You know, it works. They make it work. But it's not as effective when Ro- Rosemary is not as dark. You know, like when she's sitting in, you know, in a corner of the arena with purple and green lights shining on her. Like, it's it's, it's just not really the same. But the fans want to see these two back together. It makes sense storyline wise to get them back together, and, and I think they're going to win. And then they start going to they're going to save Havoc. I don't know what that means exactly, because Havoc just got squashed. Like I don't understand how she's on the shelf. So they're going to win. I'm pretty sure the influence is going to lose. I believe Tennille Dashwood has to take some time off. She may even be done with Impact after this. I hope not, because I like the influence. I like her, but she's been around for a while. Like she's the she's the next one in the on the roster where you're kind of like. I think we're coming near the the expiration date, you know, kind of like that Willie Mack, you know, I've been around three years. You you know what I'm saying? Like it just, it just feel like that's like, she's the next one. So we'll see if that's the case or not. I, I, I really don't want it to be. I think, I think there's some stuff you can continue to do with the influence, but it just seems like with the knockouts tag teams, they're almost formed strictly for the sake of winning the title. And then once they lose the title, it's like, what, what do we do with them at this point? They break them up or they, they do something, you know? They've done an okay job booking the tag team division for the knockouts. There's some people who are not a fan of it. I think, I think they're doing okay with it, though. But I really think Rosemary and Ty are going to win. Rosemary's one that, like I said earlier, with Jordan Grace, and I was refer- referencing EC3, there's, there's people on the roster who just need a belt at some point. And they, they missed that boat with Rosemary several times. At this point, like I can't even imagine her holding the knockouts championship, but the, the tag team championships could work. You know, she did hold them at one point with Havoc. They were placeholders. I mean, they were just there to have the belts until the inspiration came, you know. But I think they're going to get a little, Rosemary is going to get a little comeuppance here as far as how they've treated her character. And I think they're going to win the belts here. They have this on the main show. It's probably because they have Taya Valkyrie and then they feel like if Taya was in this match, it would be on the pre show. But, you know, Taya just came from WWE. You know how they are. We can put her on the main show now. You know, but this 100%, if it was the old Taya Valkyrie, like she was still there, or if uh, it was someone else, if it was Havoc, if Havoc was her partner, or if like Sue Young was her partner or something like that, it would be on the pre-show. So let's hope it's a good knockouts tag team match. But I do think Taya and Rosemary are going to win. Queen of the Mountain match. They got Mickey James as a special guest enforcer. At first, I was like, why is she the enforcer? But then I thought about the rules. I'm like, ah, it makes sense. You got to have someone out there who can kick some ass and, you know, make sure they go in the penalty box and all that. I think they've done a poor job of really explaining what this match is, of hyping it up and getting people excited for it outside of the people who watch Impact on a regular basis. I think there's a lot more, a lot more they could have done. Uh, to just to be creative. They put out a video the other day of Mia Yim, why she needed to win. That's what I've been asking for. But why can't all, everyone get that? You know, if you guys ever watched the Global Force Wrestling, not the bullshit version we got, but the actual Global Force Wrestling, the, you know, the, the stuff that Jeff Jarrett did together, it didn't make TV. You watch those episodes and that's so reminiscent of what I think Impact should be doing. You know, they did that just just very focused video packages on everyone and making you get behind each wrestler in a match to where you just didn't feel like they were just there. 
you know, you just had to, they didn't do anything without having an opportunity to speak and put themselves over, you know, and especially with this match with everyone being knockouts, te- uh, knockouts champions in the past. I can't say knockouts world champion. That's so weird. Obviously when they started calling the AEW, the impact champion, and then there was the impact women's champion on WWE, all of a sudden uh, impact was like, yo, we're world champions. So we're going to let everyone know that these are all world titles. I just can't say that it doesn't roll off the tip of my tongue, but these guys are all former knockouts champions. And I feel like there's a way in, you know, I keep talking about video packages for this match. You highlight these girls, show them winning the knockouts championship, show, show all their victories. Each gets an individual video package, why they need to win this match. It shows highlights of old, uh, not ultimate X, but queen of the map matches then show highlights of them winning the belt. So I, th- I, I really think there was just so much more they could have done. They could have got Mickey James involved in some way on TV. I mean, they got her and all this involved in this pay-per-view and they didn't have to show up for the tapings, but it's Tasha Steele. She's the champ. She's going to lose the spoiler. Alert, okay. So if, you, if anyone thinks she's going to win, you're wrong. Uh, versus Chelsea Green versus Deanna Perrazzo versus Jordan Grace versus Mia Yim. So this whole time I said Deanna's going to win. She's going to steal it from Mia Yim one way or another at the end. And then um, and then they're going to set up a Bound for Glory match between the two. I was positive I could have bet money because I love to bet money. I could have bet money that's what was going to happen. I think now Jordan Grace is going to win, like I was talking about at the top of the show. It's that time for her to win a belt. She, I don't count the digital media championship because that's not a real championship, in my opinion. <laughs> it's, it's, no one cares about it. They can make people care about it, but they choose not to. Um, she needs this title. Her and Deanna need it. But the reason I'm, I'm kind of swerving a little bit with Deanna is because now they're, late, they're, they're teaming her up with Chelsea Green. I can see them going for the knockouts tag team titles after this, right? Remember they, they just, they'll put people together for the sake of a knockouts feud title feud. It's because I think, um, Ty Valkyrie and Rosemary are going to win. I think it just makes sense. Okay. Well, we need some opponents. It's going to be Chelsea and Deanna. I don't know if they're going to win the belts. They probably will because I don't think Ty is really around for very long. And uh, those two as tag team top champions would be great for the knockouts division. I'm talking about Deanna and Chelsea. So uh, I do think Jordan Grace is going to win this. I think she's going to beat Tasha Steele's the very next episode of Impact. And so they can make us forget she ever had the belt. And uh, they're going to set up Jordan versus Mia Yim at Bound for Glory. So I'm, I'm now actually confident in saying that's what they're going to do. Mia Yim is going to be in the knockouts title match at Bound for Glory. It doesn't matter if it's a two person match three four if it's a freaking knockouts reverse battle royal like she is going to be there um in that match i i uh, there's there's nothing i'm more confident about that impact wrestling is doing right now and then we got the main event oh excuse me we got the x division i'm sorry the ultimate x match ace austin versus kenny king versus mike bailey trey miguel jack evans and zach alex zane aside from kenny king and you can say ace austin even though he hasn't been on impact no one has real momentum here. Trey Miguel just got this win. He needed this win. There's three competitors in this match that we did not see on this episode of Impact. And it's not on this episode, in this tapings, this set of tapings. We didn't see three of these people. So I, I, I envision one of the best Ultimate X matches we ever seen. I, I truly do. I think these guys' styles, just they're all so entertaining. I envision that, but I'm disappointed because there's just, it just, there should be a lot more hype behind this match. There, there just really should be. But I mean, how can you when no one's on the damn screen? Impact Twitter and all these had an opportunity to take us through Ace Austin's journey in New Japan, and they chose not to. They didn't say when he was winning and how many points he had in a Super Juniors, nothing. All they did was like Ace Austin joined the Bullet Club when that happened. They felt like that was newsworthy. But there's a story they could have told us with Ace Austin in the meantime. And then, you know, the way they do keep doing these video packages for Eric Young, Josh Alexander, like, I don't see why they just kind of can't do some of that stuff for the, the mid-card stuff with the X Division, you know? Like, 
these guys should be getting the packages too. You know, so I'm disappointed because I think as far as a story, there's just there's just none. But the match itself, I think, is going to be excellent. Then they have to lay off Ultimate X for a little bit because they like to like to tell us the return of Ultimate X. Yeah, but you have our Ultimate X every three months, so you can't just keep saying it's the return. It's like the return of Monsters Ball. You know, if we get a no DQ match every other week, you know, is it really returning? So I think they have to lay off it a little bit and get back to some storytelling in the X division. You know, as far as the victor, Ace Austin is going to win. I'm pretty confident in that. And they're going to set up, finally set up him and Mike Bailey for Bound for Glory. That's what I think they're going to do. So I had Mike Bailey take a loss here so we can forget that he, you know, has a thing with Ace. And Mike is one of those guys, we can't wait for him to be the champion. And in the past, Impact would have put the belt on him his very first title match. But they're they're moving slowly with him, which is how they should do it with him. He has an opportunity to be one of the homegrown stars with the company. He's freaking excellent. So leave it at that. Just leave it at the slow build with him. And if he beats Austin at Bound for Glory, awesome. Like he very well could. But I don't see Ace Austin with all the Bullet Club stuff. I don't see him losing. I, I just can't see. I can see him tag teaming with Chris Bay quite a bit going forward and Chris Bay taking a bunch of L's because Ace is the champion and they can't have him get pinned. But I can't see him losing this match. And then the main events, Josh Alexander, Eric Young. I have not been a huge fan of how they put this together. I shouldn't say I haven't been. It's been more of a roller coaster. I felt like the very beginning they did the video package with Eric Young, took us through his career, and I was like, yo, we're on to something here. And then as the weeks pass, it's just a bunch of sneak attacks. They keep getting their hands on each other. You know, they keep showing beatdowns of Josh Alexander. They are telling you, hey, Josh Alexander is going to win this match. <laughs> they're, they're telling you with all these segments where he's gotten no comeuppance whatsoever, hey, he's going to win. So we know he's going to win. We know Eric Young is not going to win. Eric Young's the right opponent for Slammiversary. It's the right story. But I just think some of the ways they went about it was um, was just not creative. I thought Josh Alexander, this was not one, of, one of the reasons I hated the episode last week, he needed to beat Joe Doring. You're sitting here, Joe Doring's undefeated. Da, da. The world champion can't beat him going into Slammiversary to face his leader? I mean, this is like, tried and true two guys go to a pay-per-view one guy who if he's a part of a stable the guy runs through the stable i mean that, that what, what are you waiting for 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 joe dorian to lose a match like what in the world this is not brock lesnar and um i mean i think what they're trying to do is it's the story of they are trying to keep the sympathy for Josh Alexander going. I, I know that's, I mean, that's clearly the story. That's what they're trying to do where he just kept getting jumped and, you know, they lost the match with the Briscoes and all that. They're trying to keep the sympathy going. I was really worried when he had the, when the moose food, excuse me, feud with Moose was over. I was really worried. What are they going to do with Josh at this point? Because Moose really carried that feud and the sympathy on Josh Alexander's would help that work. That's what helped the story work. So they're kind of doubling down on it. We're going to keep the sympathy going for Josh. After this feud, though, and after he wins, they can't do that anymore. He can't go back to the, you know, and, and the, he's doing the white meat baby face. Like, oh, I, I love TNA and this company and AJ Styles and Samoa Joe. All this shit, okay? That works right now for this feud. But after this one is over. This is going to be the real test for Josh Alexander. Can he just get away with being a badass babyface and beating people up and having great matches? His promo skills are not that bad. Is he like super interesting to listen to? No, but he's come. A, he's pretty good. He, he's 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 above average. He's well above average. It's just I think the material of you know I love this place. I'm Mister Impact USA. Um, I don't think that is going to continue to work if they keep doing it. We're used to some guys with a little bit of personality like Moose holding the title. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, the concern I have with it. After this feud, who who's going to step up? I feel like the person who's going to step up, though, is going to show up at the end of this show, whether it's 
Well, it's not going to be someone from the roster because they're going to factor some surprises into the show. We already know that. I feel like his next challenger is not going to come from this roster, from this current full-time roster or even part-time roster. This is the roster page of Impact Wrestling. I don't think that's where his opponent is going to come from. I, you know, I think um, I don't know all these Tanahashi's and Wakasabi's and all these from Japan that um, these guys I keep saying they're coming to the United States. I get them all confused. I'm I'm not trying to sound like they all look the same and all that. I just get them confused because I can't remember any of their names. So when I hear this guy's coming and then this guy's coming, I'm like, I, I don't know which one's which. I, I just struggle with that when it comes to New Japan stars because I don't care. I just don't enjoy their product. I, I'm fairly certain, though, <clears throat> excuse me, because uh, Lewis was telling me there's someone coming to the States from, from New Japan, one of, one of the bigger names. I feel like he's going to show up at the end of this and chat. It, it just That's kind of the Josh Alexander thing. The, you know, Japan guy is going to come challenge him. You know, he's always fighting guys from New Japan, the part-timers, randos. I think that's what they're going to do with this as well. I think that's going to be the next feud. Um, until Eddie Edwards eventually steps in and they have a Bound for Glory match, which I think that's where they're going to go with that as well. Uh, because we know Honor No More is likely going to get disbanded after this pay-per-view. I really think they, I don't see why you would keep them together because you're not doing anything good with them. So I think Eddie's going to kind of break off and they're going to, I don't know how they're going to keep him a heel by himself. That's going to be interesting, but I, I'm just speculating here. But the match, this is going to be one of the better matches on the show. Eric Young's very underrated in the ring. Josh Alexander's going to win, but I am concerned with how they're going to do the next couple of feuds. Again, if it's a, if it's something with someone from Japan, how are they going to, you know, it'll be an impact plus match. We know that, but I just don't know if the sympathy thing and the I'm Mr. TNA, I don't know if that's going to work going forward. So they got to turn the page and find what's the next step of character development within Josh Alexander, because what a TW and I always talk about the freaking theme song, um, I mean, it was a tag team heel th- song. It's slow when it's plotting. The people are not going to pop for that. They never do. Here, listen to it on TV. There's no yay, you know, like you'll see people clapping because that's the only, that's the appropriate response for a song like that, you know? Um, and then I'm a little worried about if he does feud with Eddie, Eddie Edwards, like Eddie Edwards promos are not good. Even though as a bit, as a heel, you can get a little more, creative and step out of your comfort zone a little bit well i say step out of your comfort zone but i mean you can try new things and then you kind of find something that works but it, you, i guess i'm just saying as a heel there's more opportunity to try new things and and, and for it to work with a baby face you can't really do that you just have to deliver when you're giving your promos you cannot you can't miss because people are going to turn against you instantly. The minute you cut out there, go out there and cut some boring babyface promo, like Adam Page did in AEW, all of a sudden you've lost the people, you know? So I'm worried about that feud because I think that's where it's going for Bound for Glory. But I am worried overall for Josh Alexander. They just have to turn the page, take the next step with his character development. They have to after this feud. When they were doing the contract signing and he's listing off the Samoa Joes and all that, how many promos backstage do we hear people doing that exact thing? It works for Slammiversary. All of it works for Slammiversary. So everything they're doing within the feud. But he has to develop the character. He has to take the next step after this, after Slammiversary. When he shows up on the episode next week and whoever the challenger is, he has to take the next step. I'm going to keep saying that. That's going to be one of my themes in the episodes going forward. So that's what I got for Slammiversary, guys. I think there's going to be some surprises. I don't think they're going to be huge. I don't I don't think, you know, um, I, I can't even think of a big name. I don't think we're going to get some big name debut by any stretch. We could. Who knows? But um, I don't think that's where they're, they're going with it. There's too many knockouts involved in the pay-per-view for them to debut a, a chick. So I, I don't see that happening. But, um, I, you know, I, if there's a guy out there, maybe they'll show up. Who knows? But I think it's going to be a lot of, you know, former team like we're going to see shark boy uh in in the reverse battle royal and we're going to see guys like that absolutely but i think it's going to be a fun show we're disappointed with the the, you know the ticket sales and the way they promoted it and 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 things like that for the most part the television has been good 
And usually after a pay-per-view, it's really good. Like, that's where I always get, like, really excited again, you know? Um, so we'll see. We will see how they handle television after this. I think it'll be good, though. So thanks for checking me out, guys. I'm your boy, BQ. It's the Impact Lounge. It's the Cool Factor. I'm out. Peace.